for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, make a careful search for the child, and as soon as you find him, report it to me, because I want to go worship him too. <laughs> and after they had heard this king, heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures that presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Let's pray. God, thank you for this account from your life. Um, thank you for the story of these wise men. May it guide us as we move forward into this next year. Amen. So this is the text. We got to sing about it. We three kings of Orient are. Ironically, not kings, magi, advisors, uh, wise men, uh, advisors to the kings. They were kind of like astrologers, and they would they would look to the heavens and they would watch what was going on, and they would uh, try to pick up what God was doing through the movement of the stars. Um, ironically, there isn't necessarily three of them either. There could have been twenty of them. We know that there's three gifts, but we really don't know how many they are. And they probably weren't from the Orient. They were uh, from Persia or Babylon. So that's still a three to six month journey. So I'm still impressed by the fact that they uh, they went on all those steps, uh, lots of miles. Um, they didn't come to a manger though. They came to a house that Mary and Joseph had settled in in uh, Bethlehem sometime in the first two years of Jesus' life. And so um, the We Three Kings of Orient Dar has officially failed my Bible course. <laughs> but it's still a lovely song. Um, I'm sorry if I just ruined that carol for you. Uh, the wise men, though, are pretty awesome in and of themselves, and that's where we're going to turn our attention. Um, so their journey began as they were watching these stars, and, and something didn't quite fit. Everything is moving along, but there was a special star, and, and it headed them out west, and, and they recognized it as a star of, of royalty. It led them uh, to the country of Judea and um, to Israel. And their journey began um, with God reaching out to them in exactly the way that they knew how to listen to God. Um, it's, it's significant to me that God meets us right where we're at. I don't know where you're at right now. But whatever it is that you're in the midst of, whatever uh, baseline you have, if you are seeking the Lord, I believe that He's going to meet you. He's going to move you forward in your life. It's, it's a beautiful thing that God meets us right where we're at. And, um, and then he leads us. It says that the star led them uh, one step at a time. And they didn't know to go to Bethlehem. They didn't know to go to a particular house at the time. They, they headed out. I don't even know if they knew how long they were going to be gone. But they headed out and... I often wish that God would lead me by giving me the next um, like five-year plan in my life. That I would know all the steps to take and all the decisions would be crystal clear. And when I prayed about something, God would say, okay, I want you to go this way, not that way. Um, but that's not how it works. I keep asking John to do that for me. We sit down and sit down and go, all right, John, I need you to lay out everything that you want me to do. And it's a nice cut and dry and write a calendar for me. Um, <laughs> But the beautiful thing is, is this is the season of Emmanuel. He was God with us. And God doesn't go ahead of us and just lay out all the steps. Instead, he says, no, I want to be with you. I want to journey with you as you move forward into this next year. Maybe it's a better way to actually walk with God instead of just get marching orders from God and have him send us out. And I just, uh, I want you to know just from my heart that I, I really appreciate you as a congregation. I appreciate being with you because I found you to be people who love the Lord and just want to seek him together and um, are okay if not everything's cut and dry. But, but we're going to journey forward and we're going to see what the Lord has for us this year. Now back to these wise men. You know, uh, they must have been quite surprised, maybe uh, even underwhelmed. On finding Jesus, you know, they had gone to the capital of Israel. They had gone 
to the palace, which is exactly where you expect to find the king. And I sometimes wonder if they didn't expect to find a huge, giant throng of people waiting in line to, to see this royal baby that would have been sitting in the palace, uh, maybe with this golden blankie and <laughs> lots of pomp and circumstance. And, and they get there, and, and what they find instead is Herod. And, uh, and he's as confused as anybody. And he goes, what? A new king? And, uh, and then they, they gather everybody who knows anything about the Bible, the Bible teachers of the day, and they go, well, where would we look? And they point him to Bethlehem. And um, those are the characters kind of in the story, the Magi, King Herod, and the religious elite of Jerusalem. And um, as I've prayed about and thought about this text, I think they offer us some different perspectives on what it would look like to move forward into 2016 that can guide us a bit. I want to begin with Herod. Um, Herod the Great, uh, not because he was great for his people, but because he attempted to do incredible great things to uh, impress the world about how wonderful of a guy he was, how great a ruler he was. He governed Israel from 37 to 4 BC. He is uh, famous for being a brutal ruler. He, um, he wanted to protect his place on the throne at whatever cost was necessary. And then he uh, took the resources that were available to him, his, his, his wealth, his power, his uh, land, and then he did giant projects like monuments to try to impress the world about how great he was. Um, he's famous for building the city of Caesarea, which is right on the water, a um, beautiful view of the water, and there he would host the games every five years and had administrative offices with a nice, nice uh, coastal view. And uh, he also built Masada, which is a fortress that he could go hide in uh, if he ever felt threatened. Um, so, incredibly poor country, and he's taking resources and building for himself a seaside resort and a, a fortress to go hide in. And the sad thing is that his greatness was never for the betterment of the people. It was always for the betterment of himself. And there's a lot of examples of, of Herod, but probably the most famous is that he... Uh, used the information that he got from the three kings to send out a hit squad to kill all the babies who were under two years old that were male um, in an attempt to wipe out Jesus because Jesus might one day come and take his throne. The crazy thing about this is Herod was 70 years old at this point in his life. Maybe a couple of years left in his life. Um, but he was a paranoid and fearful man worried about losing what he had. Upon hearing that biography, uh, it may be tempting to go, man, he's a horrible man, and, and I'm so glad that I'm, I'm nothing like him. Uh, but I think we can all get a little bit focused on ourselves. We all try to guard our stuff and our life. We can be selfish, and we can worry about our kingdom. Uh, I know for me, uh, the kingdom of self sort of pops up because I want everybody else to recognize me like they recognize, like Herod wanted to be recognized. I want people to see me and go, man, you're great. You do fantastic things. And, uh, and I want to have my way. Uh, I notice when I'm arguing with my wife or when I'm disappointed with how things are going, generally it revolves around me not getting my wants and desires. Um, I too can be manipulative times to try to get what I want. And it's usually not mean-spirited, it's just that at some moments I care more about myself than I do about other people. Okay, a lot of moments. <laughs> <laughs> when I was shopping this week on my quest, uh, I gotta tell you, when I came across that last one of something, there was a part of me that whether or not it was the right present or not, I wanted to grab it, and I really didn't care about that lady who also wanted it for her family. I, I really wasn't interested in her story. What I wanted to do was get it, bring it home, and then brag to Christina how I had gotten the last one at the expense of somebody else's Christmas. Um, I know that my Scrooge pants came on this year when we were talking about the fact that my brother uh, was engaged and we were going to do this blended Christmas, and I'm going, yeah, but you can't screw up my Christmas traditions. I know your family has some, but you can leave those on the side and come and join ours, maybe. But me lose my ravioli dinner that's so special to me and include your ham in that? No. 
That's silly, right? <laughs> you know, I wrote the sermon while I was sitting in a strip mall, and I was sitting at Starbucks, and right next to Starbucks is about five stores, and there is a uh, tanning place and a personal gym in those uh, that place. And, and I could be wrong, but I'm guessing that most people don't go tanning because they're lacking in vitamin D and they need it for health reasons. Or the, the going to the gym and doing the workout thing isn't just so they have more energy and a healthy lifestyle. We, in different ways, have a way of focusing on our future. Um, I think it can be a strong force in our life and to the extent that we pour our lives into ourselves. <coughs> Rather than loving God and loving others, I think we're going to miss out on something. And the wise men remind us that uh, Herod's life didn't leave good ripples in the world. Been thinking about that. The wake. No boat cruises out and there's like a wake behind it and it affects other things. And uh, what's the wake of our lives going to be in 2016? What's that wake going to look like? Um, Are the wakes going to be trying to get other people to come around and support our vision and our dreams and what we want in the world? Or will the wake of our life be blessing others, loving God, loving others? It's tempting. All of us have it in us. Um, I love the fact that the scriptures that all Jerusalem was troubled along with Herod. It didn't just say Herod was a rotten guy. James puts it this way, 1, 14 and 15. Each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desires and they're enticed. And that desire, if it's conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. And for you and I, um, if we not give birth to a lot of death in our life and lose out on the abundant life that Christ has for us, may ourself not choke out what God wants to do in you and me this year. To put it positively, though, to the extent that we can set aside our life, to the extent that we can say, God, what do you want for me? I want to be a part of what you're doing. We're going to find abundant life that a lot of people miss. When Jesus comes into our life, he doesn't just come as a Lord. He comes as a Savior. He comes as a loving King, a shepherd, this scripture says. One to guide us into good life. One to help us set aside the kingdom of self that comes so naturally to us and say, there's another kingdom that you can be a part of, and it's mine. Come join me. It's a beautiful place to be. And part of preparing to receive Jesus, part of this Christmas time, is the prayer of John the Baptist. He must increase, I must decrease. May it not be about me this year. And the beauty of it is we get a lot of help when we accept Christ into our life. The power of his spirit comes to dwell in us, and that power has an ability to shake us free of this self-focused and help us to love him, love others. As I think about the world right now, I see a lot of fear. Harry had a lot of fear. I see a lot of things driven by fear. I see a lot of things driven by self-protection, and those don't make the world a better place. And Jesus gives us another route kingdom of love that we can be a part of. So, back to our story. Herod, troubled, a new king in town, worried, might upset my kingdom. I don't want that. He calls together everybody who would know the scriptures and uh, the, the chief priests and the, the scribes, the teachers of the law came by and um, these were the hardcore religious people of their day, and, and they knew the scriptures really well. Um, and and uh, they were consultants for Herod when he needed them. And they go, well, well where would you look? Well, to Bethlehem. Uh, Bethlehem is about five miles away from Jerusalem, by the way. Short little jaunt. Um, they knew Micah 5-2. It says in Bethlehem, the ruler and shepherd for God's people Israel will come from there. And... Um, and here's what's striking me about them. There's no sign that they did anything with that information. It's crazy. Like, Herod should not have been able to find them. The shepherds already knew that the Messiah had come, and they were yelling it out to everybody who would hear him. And they probably heard that and go, oh, that's interesting. But it's over about them. And then Herod calls them up and goes, hey, could you guys come and give us some more information about where we might want to go look if we want to find this newborn king? And Herod shouldn't have been able to find them because they should have already been in Bethlehem 
doing their own search. They already knew where to go. There's no sign in the scripture that they left with the Magi. Uh, I've never seen a nativity set with scribes and the chief priests. Um, it's not in there. Um, that worries me a wee bit. It worries me uh, that they were met. They met this with information about what God would be. They didn't respond to it. No, oh, here's the information. Oh, we really like this kind of status quo. We got a good thing going with Herod, and and we're in a position of power and influence, and, and we're okay with things staying the same. Um, so they had the information, but they didn't take any steps. Um, it's crazy to me. They're five miles away. The Magi have just traveled six months, uh, many many miles to find the baby, and they aren't taking a step five miles away. They just didn't respond. Um, apathy is the opposite of faith. Sometimes I've heard it that, that it's struggle or doubt or questions, and, and at least in my experience, questions and doubts are really powerful things because they force us into a time where we got to figure out from God what we're going to do. We wrestle with God, and, and, and in the end, we step away stronger in our faith with a new understanding. Uh, it's uncomfortable to have doubts and questions, but they're really, really good for faith growing. Apathy is really, really dangerous though. Gradually falling asleep, the way no longer moving forward because we just don't care anymore what God's kingdom has. That's that's a scary place. That's the real thing that crushes faith. Um, and I gotta admit, uh, I was looking around my study, and I probably have 20 or 30 Bibles, and I have bookcase after bookcase after bookcase of books about faith. And yet there are mornings where I wake up and I go, I can pray, or I can watch a movie. <laughs> I'll do a movie. Um, that snazzy Bible that I have with a really nice cover, it really doesn't do much for me unless I... Uh, get into it and then start responding to it. And I was I was over at a friend's house uh, recently, and there's this little corner that he uses um, to go spend time with the Lord. And, and he had a little sign up next to it, and it, and it caught my eye. And it said, um, "A Bible that's falling apart often shows a life that's not." And I was struck by that. I go, maybe that's a good goal for 2016. I'll wear out my Bible and see what happens. Um, <laughs> We have so much and we gotten so comfortable that we have so much access to stuff. We're not in a village where we have one Bible and we have to share it amongst each other. We have incredible resources. We're not a country that persecutes us for getting together and worshiping the Lord and loving God. But we also have so much of it that it's so easy to just get comfortable and inoculate and go, well, that's just what I do and not look at it fresh. Um, Another reason why I love this church, when you get together and worship, it seems like you really want to worship. You pray, you, you pray about the stuff you really care about. We're not just going through the motions here. That's what I feel like these chief priests were doing. They went through the motions. And it challenges me because I find myself more worried about the Seahawks run towards the Super Bowl sometimes than I do about God saving me and saving those around me. Um, The good news, Emmanuel, Christ, nearby, he's always there. He's always at our door saying, let me in, fresh start, new day. What are we going to do today? And we have the opportunity not just to come to worship, but to invite God into our day and say, God, I want to do this with you. Whatever it is I do, I want to do it with you. I'm not going to do the status quo this year. I'm going to see what Emmanuel looks like. So the danger of Herod is, is uh, selfishness and sin and choking out our faith. The danger of the scribes and the Pharisees is um, this subtle falling asleep and getting groggy in our faith. Uh, thankfully, there's a beautiful alternative, and it's the Magi. They respond to what they see, and God leads them into more. First, they just came to check out what God was doing, and then the next thing you know, they're exposed to the scriptures, and and the scriptures guide them to the next place. And, and then it says that as they went, uh, a star appeared in front of them, and they uh, 
and they could see it and it guided them and they were overjoyed at this experience of encountering God in the midst of their journey and leading them. And then when it stopped, man, they get to see God face to face. And they did it all on faith. They walked to Jerusalem, hoping to find the baby in the palace, didn't find him there. Then they walked the five miles into this little town of about 5,000 people, and nobody was really focused on this baby Jesus in that town. But they trusted that God would get them the next step, guide them in their journey. All the hardship, all the trials of that six-month journey, and then they find themselves in a little hovel with a little boy, who's a little toddler, probably snot on his nose and everything. And they aren't put off by the poverty. They're not put off by the fact that this is not very impressive. Because they see right through the stuff of the world. They interacted with it, they engaged it, but it wasn't what they were after. What they were after was meeting the new one king, Jesus. God shows up in the everyday. Little moments when you're at work, when you're talking with a friend, God shows up in your life. And those are the moments when we discover abundant life and we find ourselves overjoyed. That's what the Magi wanted. That's what they made their quest. And it's incredibly amazing. We want joy, we want hope, we want peace. We want love, these things that we have looked at this Advent season, and they're all found in this one person, Jesus. That's what we seek. May this be a year where we can be like the Magi. However much, however little we know, we draw near to God, we respond. When he gives us something to respond to, and we look for him. And when we find him, we bow down and we worship. We say, Lord, Here's my life. You can have that. And then we bring what's uniquely ours. They brought the perfect gifts. Brought them all the way from Persia and Babylon. These things, and they were exactly what's needed in the next part of the text, which is Jesus needing to escape Herod. And now they had these treasures with them that they could use to get settled in Egypt for the next two years. When we give our lives to Christ, when we offer ourselves out, however small or meaningless or helpless as it might seem. It's just the right thing that somebody else needs in the world. It leads us into a beautiful place where God can provide for us and for those around us as we go on this journey together. So I'm excited. We're heading into 2016. Next Sunday, it will be that year. And we're doing this together. We're moving forward together. And if we give our lives to Christ, if we seek Him, we'll do it. Uh, we're going to be exactly what God needs to give each one of us. So, with that, uh, I'm going to invite you on that quest with me. Can we do that this next year? Mm-hmm. Can we follow Christ together and see what God wants to do in our world and through this little church? Uh, awesome. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you that you give us just enough, that you show us the next step, that you provide for us in amazing ways. Help us to not get too caught up in the kingdom of ourselves and worrying about what people think of us or worrying about the things that we're trying to build, but instead to worry about the things that you're trying to build. Lord, enliven us. Give us your joy and help us to pursue you. Give us the strength not to be a place where we just fall asleep and go through the motions and take what we know and don't do anything with it. God, thanks for inviting us into abundant, incredible life with you. Help us to make this next year one of those years where we spend it with you. We love you. Amen.